the very beginning of Shmos, page 292. So it says, Ve'elah Shmos Yisrael, page 292. Ve'elah Shmos B'nei Yisrael HaBoyim Mitzrayma. These are the names of B'nei Yisrael come to Egypt. Ace Yaakov, along with Yaakov, Ishu Beis Obo. The word ace in Hebrew, S or ace, could sometimes mean, it's, it's, in one context, it is a untranslatable word in English, because I want at Z, I want this. And so in English, there is no word. What would you call that, a pre-directive no. uh, It's some sort of, yeah, it, it's, got no, it's got no translation. Uh, it, you're, it's, you're pointing at an object and saying, I want this. Because even in Hebrew, you can say, Ani wrote se ze. That's not incorrect. But you usually say, Ani wrote se et ze. Okay, in English, there is no word. I want this. There is no word that goes between want and this other than no, <laughs> you know, that, but that comes afterwards. So, so the word S is generally, is, and that's one context. There's another context of S which means with. That's the context that means over here. These are the name of the Bnei Sohar coming with Yaakov. That's why you see signs, like in English you'll have a, a sign, you know, Murphy and Richards. In Hebrew it's Murphy et Richards, right? With, with the, the, the et is the and sound. So here you have the Jewish people are coming, the Torah goes back and reviews, they've already been in Egypt, but they're coming down to Egypt. So the commentary, I think Rav Hirsch says over here that you have, uh, uh, the first lesson you have here is a lesson in, this is the foundation of Jewish nationality. The foundation of Jewish nationality is connection to the previous generation. Jews are connected to the previous generation. We honor our parents because our parents are our individual parents and our parents are our connection to the previous generation. We have a chain that goes all the way back to Har Sinai and it goes back even further to, uh, to, to, to Avram Avinu. Do you know there's a, remarkable, there's a remarkable statement that says that the donkey that Avram Avinu rode when he took the donkey to the Akeda, the donkey of Avram Avinu was the same donkey ridden by Moshe Rabbeinu and it's the same donkey that would be ridden by Melech HaMashiach. Mm -hmm. right? Same donkey. donkey. The donkey, what's that? That's one lucky donkey. One lucky donkey, right? And not only lucky donkey, that means the donkey lived a long time. You know, the donkey's still running around somewhere. So, uh, <laughs> so, the, so the donkey, the donkey, uh, uh, yeah, the donkey is, uh, the donkey of Avram Avinu is the, is, is, is the same donkey as, as Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the same donkey as yeah. Melech HaMashiach. I mean, okay, if you say so. What's the, what, 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 what's it teaching us? The answer is it's teaching us that there are a lot of changes in the Jewish people from the time of Avram Avinu. But it's not going to change. It's not going to change. We're going to be the same Jewish people for Avram Avinu, David, uh, 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 Moshe Rabbeinu, and then Melech HaMashiach. We have a, train, a chain of tradition. That chain of tradition is vital. The chain of tradition is vital for the Jewish people. Elish Shmos B'nei Sohaboy Mitzrayma. This is their names. Es Yaakov. They came with Yaakov Avinu. Connection. Connection to the Father. That's the, that's the way to go. Oh, I'll tell you a funny story. A guy once came to Chaim Kinevsky. He claimed he's the Mashiach. Now, what would you do with a guy who claims you're Mashiach? A lot of people would try to prove you're not, and he got delusions, and he got, and guys, the guy's obviously, guy's obviously off balance. So, Reb Chaim Kinevsky said, oh, wow, you're Mashiach. Well, so you have a donkey with a hundred different colors? God looks why he says, well, the Yerushalmi says the donkey of Mashiach is going to have a hundred different shades and colors. The guy says, no, so God says, Bring, come back when you have the donkey. Okay, come back when you have the donkey with it. You, you know, <laughs> instead of fighting and arguing, you know, okay, hey, oh, you're the Mashiach. Good, okay, I believe you. I have no problem. Just bring back a donkey with a hundred colors. And we'll, we'll, we'll be all set. We'll be good to go. <laughs> then we'll send you to the happy home. Right? But, but first, uh, you know, why, why fight? So, um, that's the first idea here. Now take a look at Rashi. We'll take a look at Rashi, the first Rashi on the page. The Elish Shmos B'nei Yisrael, says Rashi, Afal pi shemino'on b'chayehem. Even though he counted them while they were alive, Chazar umino'on b'misosan. It goes and he counts them in their death. Lehodia chibosom. After the brothers have died, it says in previous parsha of Ayomaz Yosef, Yosef and all his brothers, everybody dies. It still tells us about that. Why? Because... Um, to let us know how beloved they are. The Jewish people are compared to stars. God brings out and, and, and puts away the stars by their names. 
Shenemar, the Pesach says, Hamotzi b'misbar tzva'om l'kulam b'shem ikra. Okay, we say that in Pesuk de Zimra also, that God has names for all the stars. What does it mean the star has a name? What does it mean that a star has a name? Well, the God, there are names for all the stars. Oh, good, so you call it a name. Well, I mean, it means he's got a job. Your name is your job. A name is a description of your essence. Do you know that the name, the middle two letters of Nishama, the word Nishama, what are the two middle letters? Shin Mem, your Shem, your Shem, your name. A name is that what your name is a description of your Nishama. Your name is a description. Your name is the essence. It's the middle of your Nishama. Nishama, the middle name is Shem. So when somebody has a name, the name is a description of your Nishama. Exactly what that means, we don't know. I don't know exactly why. But your Nishama, that is the name of your Nishama. And your parents, when they named you, were actually granted a certain divine inspiration when they named you. That they should describe your Nishama. I, even though, you know, you have a kid whose name is, his name is uh, Yitzchak Shlomo, because his Zeta was Yitzchak and his great uncle was Shlomo, and they wanted to call him Shlomo Yitzchak because his great uncle, they, they made all sorts of calculations. At the end of the day, Yitzchak Shlomo is a description of his Nishama, whatever that means. So um, uh, the Jewish people are compared to stars. Okay, now, we, I think we've mentioned this in the past, but there's a beautiful, what does it mean that you're given? Why are we compared to stars? Why are we compared? What's the comparison to stars? Okay, we're compared to stars. What, what's the comparison? The comparison is like this. You know, you ever go to a funeral? Nobody should have to go. You go to a funeral. Any Jew, these guys, these four people who were killed in Harnof, when the stories started coming out about what kind of people they are, you know, you started hearing what kind of each one of them individually is a remarkable person. While they were alive, I'm sure, you know, people saw them when they were alive. You know, there's a guy, and I'm a guy, and he's a guy, and everybody's a guy. And all of a sudden, after they were nifter, the stories that came out in the Shiva house, that always happens with Jews. Because with a star, when you look at a star, a star is a little dot of light. The closer you get to the star, what happens? Brighter and brighter. Light gets brighter and brighter. The closer you get to a Jew, whatever you see, you haven't seen anything. You don't know all the things he does privately for people, all the things he does publicly for people, all the things he helps people, his meetups, everything. You have no idea what the guy, what the guy's up to. So Jewish people are compared to stars because we are all, every Jew has that potential. We, we've got that glow. And all we see of each other, remember I told you about as opposed to the nations, as opposed to big stars. Remember I told you we spoke about that once, about Paro, Paro the Gomorrah says was the size of an Amatol. Remember we spoke about that? Paro was an Amatol, an Amat is this tall. <laughs> right? So he was an Amatol. Somebody once asked me, well, if Moshe Rabbeinu was 10 Amos tall, and Paro was one amma tall. Most it says was ten ammos tall. And Paro was one. Why don't you just step on him? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't leave. Oh, yeah. Boom. <laughs> and just, and just yeah. stomp him, right? So it says Paro was one amma tall. But then there's another statement that says King Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonian king, destroyed the base of Mingdash. King Nebuchadnezzar was cut on Kikad. He was the size of a jug. What does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, what was a premium? To be emperor, you had to be able to walk under this table without bending your knees. That's, the, that's like the test, you know, like the Navy SEALs. You know, that's qualification. Physical qualification, you have to be able to walk under You're dangerous. Oh, I know why everybody's afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. He could bite people in their knee, right? <laughs> you always got him a surprise like, dude, right in his shins. Oh, I hate when that happens. Yeah, that's why those are the two, the greatest emperors we ever had. He's the size of, a, 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 of, a, of, of an ama, and he's the size of a jug. What does that mean? So I'll tell you, I was stuck, because it says it in two different places. One is a Gemara, one's a Medrash, and I really never understood what does that mean. Didn't it? You know when it hit me? You know Rabbi Sinclair? Anything about his background? Yeah. yeah, okay. So Rabbi Sinclair, when he got married, I was at his Sheva Rochus. So I remember he got up and he said that, you know, he was rubbing elbows with the rich and famous. He said, big names, famous people, big, he said, but when you got to know these people, they were very, really very small people. As soon as he said that, ding, 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 the coin dropped. That's what the Medrash tells you. The Medrash tells you you could be a paro, you could be a Nebuchadnezzar, you could rule the world, destroy the base of Migdash in charge of millions of people. You're a little itty-bitty jug, that's what you are as a person. You're just a small, small, petty person. So as you see, you ever been to a picnic? You go to a picnic, I love when this happens, you go to a picnic, and they have corned beef and roast beef. Every, every known kosher beast known to man has made the supreme sacrifice to be on that table <laughs> with corn chips, potato <laughs> chips, popcorn, all the chaz around the world. There's always one guy who says, hey, nobody brought, nobody brought the mustard? What, there's no mustard here? There's no mustard? And the rest of the day, all he does is talk about the mustard. I got, there's no mustard? How am I going to do without the mustard? You got, you got, you got a repast over there. there. No mustard? No, he's a mustard mustard. <laughs> Oh, what a little person. What a small person. You understand? That? A petty person. So you could be an emperor and you could be a petty person. The Jew's the opposite. By the, by, by the big, the rich, and the famous, 
had somebody tell me I knew a lawyer. I knew a lawyer from Los Angeles. There was a famous actress here, already retired, and her house was broken into. So he said she was just a miserable person. She came down to the law office, and she was fetching it, and he said, well, there's nothing we can so sue somebody. <laughs> That's what she said, sue somebody. He said she was just a, just a petty, miserable, famous, rich, absolutely miserable person. So the Torah tells you, first of all, you know what a Jew is? A Jew looks like a little dot. Take a look at the guy next to you. The guy next to you is a star. And the only reason that you see a little dot is you don't really see the person. If you spent a day, if you spent a day with her Moshe Feinstein's that's all, by the end of the day, your jaw, your jaw would drop open. Probably read about him. In, in, in the irony of the Jew is the more time you spend with great people, the bigger they get, not the smaller they get. That's, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, the Gemara says that there was a, uh, there was a, uh, um, an apostate, I think it was an apostate or, or, or a tzeduki, a tzeduki who came to one, to Rabbi Yishmael, one of the time. He said, I had a dream, I had a dream that I kidnapped. He had various dreams that he was asking, asking uh, 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 Rabbi Shmuel to interpret for him. So he said, I had a dream that I, that I captured a star. So Rabbi Shmuel said to him, well, that means you obviously kidnapped a Jew, which turned out it was true. He had kidnapped a Jew. So the commentaries point out, Rabbi Shmuel didn't say to him that the dream is an indicate, indication you kidnapped a great rabbi. You kidnapped the Godel Ador. You kidnapped the, a Rosh Yeshiva. He didn't say that to him. He said you kidnapped a Jew. Every Jew is a star. Every, a star, it's a Jew. Every Jew is a star. Every Jew is, and you don't see, and the closer you get, the, br the brighter the star gets. That's idea number one. Idea number two is a very, you know the famous message that when God created the world, so the moon complained, because it says originally that God created two lights that were, were, were a, a, of equal power. So the moon complained. What was his complaint? Well, you can't have two kings with two kings with one crown. So God said, "You're right. Go reduce yourself." <laughs> okay, so make yourself smaller. Uh -oh. It wasn't quite the idea, you know. I, you know, it wasn't quite what I was thinking. God says, "Go reduce yourself." So the moon then was reduced. What did God give the moon? Stars. He gave him the stars. Okay, you'll be in charge of the stars. You'll be in charge of the stars. That'll be the way to appease the moon, right? You, you, at least you'll have an army to be in charge of. So first of all, one of the commentaries points out we see something very interesting in human nature. One of the ways to be appeased is by looking and seeing there are those that are smaller than you. Right? You're the moon. They're just the stars. I, you know, that, that appeases people. Sometimes life, you're feeling low. You know, just look around. There, there are people that are lower than you. And if none of that helps, so go take a drive past the cemetery. That'll always put you in a better mood. Because right? whatever you're going through, they, they got it worse. Right, that's a great place. Great place. If you're, ever, if you're ever in a bad mood, you want to get into a good mood. Go to the cemetery. Or go visit the. Go visit the 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 the, the uh, what do you call it? ward in the hospital, right? Go visit any just about any ward in the hospital. Right? Go to the oncology ward in the hospital, and you you'll be in a real good mood real soon. All of a sudden, puts life puts life in real good perspective. Right, and the people in the oncology ward aren't doing so well. So go go to the, that, that that'll that'll pick you up in case in case oh darn you know I missed the bus again. Oh, you missed the bus. You're upset because you missed the bus. You're you're late. <laughs> and go to the oncology ward. And, you know, talk, then we'll talk about buses later. So the 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 the, the first psychologically it appeases the moon. There's somebody smaller than you. <laughs> okay, at least I'm you know I got an army of people. But there's more than that. That tells you what was the essence of the creation of the stars. The essence of the creation of the stars was they were created in order to alleviate the pain of the moon, in order to make the moon feel better. Because that's why the Jewish people are compared to stars. The job of a Jew is to spend his life making sure people don't feel bad. That's the job of the Jew. The job of a Jew is to help people that they shouldn't feel bad. They're stars. Right? Beautiful shot, isn't it? That, that, we are stars. You know what a star is? What was this job? The essence of the star, the very creation, was to make the moon feel better. I heard about a woman with this terrible story. You love it. There's a woman. There's a, there's a, there's a wedding. There's a wedding. And uh, somebody walks up to the mother of the Kala and says to the mother of the Kala, Wow, you look so lovely. And she burst into tears. Mother of the Kala, but not, 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 not happy, they're bitter tears. Said, lady, what did I do? I just told her she looked lovely. What did I do wrong over here? You know, my goodness, women are so sensitive here. I did, you know, I said, you look so lovely. She said, why are you crying? She says, nobody has said that to me in 30 years. That means somebody was not behaving like a star. <laughs> somebody was behaving like a comet. You know, it was not behaving like a star. You understand? Our job in life is to do anything we can to alleviate people's pain, to try to make people feel better, to build people up. That's a star. 
That's what Jewish people are compared to a star. I told you you love it. The, uh, the, uh, that, that's, the, that, that's, that's, that's the first lesson of the Torah here. Okay. Now we go into the exiles. The Torah mentions their names. And then the Torah says like this. Pasuk uh, Vav. Fourth line on the page. Vayamas Yosef v'cholecha v'chol ador ha'u. The Joseph and his brothers and the entire generation die. Uvenei Yisrael. Now, count the words. Paru, one. Vayishritzu. Vayirbu. Vayatzmu bimaod maod. The Jewish people increased very much. There are six words of increase. Vatimolei ha'aretz osam. The land became filled with them. So there are six words over it. Did you ever hear that idea that the Jewish people were giving birth to six at a time? Because it's based on this puzzle. Six words over here describe six at a time. Now, gentlemen, i got to tell you, six at a time, uh, what's the world record now? It's about eight? Eight octuplets. Octuplets, uh, surviving octuplets? Yeah. Okay, so, so it, I, I know two Jewish, there are two Frum families, I don't know them, I know of them, two Frum families that have quints. The two Jewish Frum families that have quintuplets. One's in Canada, I think, one's in South Africa. Might be another one here in Israel. I think they're like one of the top fertility doctors in Israel has quintuplets. The top fertility doctor <laughs> in Israel has quintuplets. No, they didn't have any children. They have, they have quintuplets. And my wife's from Columbus. Columbus, I remember where there was a family didn't have children. Then they had quads. A from, from couple had quads. And they were the heaviest, the healthiest, heaviest quads born in, in, in the history of the United States. And they remember because they were being showered with all sorts of benefits and gifts and cribs and and diapers and baby food, that sort of thing. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty cool. So they, you know, like instant family. So you can't imagine how difficult one baby is. One baby is absolutely dominating. Absolutely. I remember a guy when I got married, a friend of mine, I invited to my wedding. He had just had a baby nine days earlier. And he said to me, I would love to come. He said, our life is being dominated by a nine-day-old dictator right now. I cannot leave my wife even for a few minutes. It's just, it just absolute, absolute dominating. Two... Three triplets, I had a friend of mine who had twins. He told me he, he was doing the night shift with the twins. He had to be up, he had to sleep from about uh, uh, seven till 12 at night, because then he was up at 12 with the, with the twins all night. And then he had to work the next day, he said he was crying. He said he cried, he physically yeah, cried. He physically, literally, oh, real tears, you know, wet, wet tears, he cried. It's just absolutely draining. So they're having six at a time over here. There's just people having six at a time, and they are multiplying abundantly. Right, so you have a small family, you know, of only 18 kids. You know, then you have the Goldsteins who have, you know, you know, 40, you know, you know, you know, 40, whatever it is, 48. And then the Schwartz is down the block with 60. You know, hey, can you imagine? You know, imagine what the what the hater looked like. So, so the 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 the, the Jewish people are abutting it now. And this pasuk vatibale yarza sub the medrash says like this. The medrash says, what does it mean? The Jews, the land became filled with the Jews. So the Medrash says that the theaters filled with Jews. And the Goyim were getting frustrated. It, you, you see history, this is the Torah, the Torah history repeats. The Torah is just a, 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 what do you call it, for exactly what we go through, what we are going through, what we always will go through. What do Jews do? I mean, the world is full of Jews. The world, they, 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 once, we, they showed a film here once at Or Sameach. They stopped non-Jews on the streets of Canada. Did you ever see this film? They stop non-Jews on the streets again. They ask them, how many Jews do you think there are in the world? So one guy says, 10 million. I got 20 million. So one guy says, well, 500 million. Hmm. These are 500 million Jews in the world, more than the entire population of the United States. So he says, where does he get the idea from? It's very simple. Hmm. You got a guy, he's a Canadian truck driver, yeah, but his doctor is Jewish. His lawyer is Jewish. The shopping center is owned by a Jew. His sports team is owned by a Jew. The agent is a Jew. The guy suing him is probably a Jew. The dentist is a Jew. Everywhere you go, they're Jews. Any, anywhere I got to do anything is a Jew. Now, the restaurant's own chain is owned by a Jew. Starbucks is owned by a Jew. So everywhere a Jew, so there must be 500 million Jews in the world. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to maintain a low profile in exile. So what do we do? We do exactly the opposite. We go and make sure that we dominate. So open up Time Magazine. Or, or Time Magazine is like a who's who in the Jewish world. There's the Jews in politics, there's the Jews in the money, and the Jews in crime, and the Jews in sports. It's just all things Jews. What, what's the percentage of Jews that won the Nobel Prize? Uh, some ridiculous yeah. percentage of Jews that were out of proportion to the representation. So the whole land is, and especially the theaters, the measures of the theaters. Who's Hollywood? Jews. Metro Goldwyn Mayer 
right? Isn't that Italian, by the way? You know, uh, 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 Goldman Brothers, uh, all the uh, Warner Brothers, you know, Warner Brothers, not Irish. You know, you know, these are all, these are all, what do you call it? It's all Jews. Jews found Hollywood. They ran Hollywood. They, they were always there. But T. Malayers, I thought, hey, what's going on? Every time I go to a movie, I got to wait the Christ theater's crowded because a bunch of Jews are pushing here. And some of them are Israelis. It's even worse. You know, they're getting pushed out of the way. They're eating Gary Neem. You know, what's going on over here? <laughs> so so, so you know, at a certain point, you start getting frustrated. And even more than that, what's the thing that frustrates you? They're taking the jobs. I can't get a job. There's a Jew's got a job. Oh. Okay, time to do something about it. The other commentaries say about Tima or some of the Jews became wealthy. That's also no good. A new king arises on Egypt. King did not know Yosef. So there are two opinions. There's one opinion that says he was a new, a new king, brand new king. A new king was born, didn't know Yosef. There's another opinion that says that he wasn't a new king. He was the old king who started a new policy. Okay? Now, here, uh, um, um, the, the, uh, 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 the idea is like this. What would you do today if you were a politician and you wanted to get popular quick? What's a surefire method to get popular quick? Blame the Jews. Yeah. Promote anti-Semitism. You promote anti-Semitism, you will be heard from and you will become popular. Will you become elected? It depends. Depends. Not necessarily clear. But it's a policy that's no fail because there are always people who are lying dormant or ready to jump on the bandwagon. Safest policy at all. So the new king, if, if it literally means a new king, so then, what's the best policy for a new king if you want to get popular, right? Start, start oppressing the Jews. That always, can't go wrong with that. Can't go wrong with that. Start oppressing the Jews, number one. Number two is a remarkable, remarkable thing. It says over here, Remember one of the decrees Yosef made? What was one of the decrees he made on the Egyptians? They have to circumcise. They have to circumcise. They have to circumcise. So the commentaries say, A new king arose over, 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 over the Jewish people, over Egypt, he banished, he put an end to that decree. No more circumcision. Now, at this point, it looks like insignificant. Look, there's no circumcision, so what? But just remember, how was it, why was it that Moshe Rabbeinu was recognized and saved? When Basia, when she opens up the, the, the basket, what does she see? She's a Jewish child. How do we know? Because he was circumcised. Oh, isn't that interesting? He had everybody been circumcised, she wouldn't know. She knew he was a Jewish child because he was circumcised. So remember the statement that HaKadosh Baruch Hu prepares the, 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 the cure is prepared before the, the wound or the disease is brought. What was, what was, what was the, 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 the preparation? So this decree right over here that the Egyptians are no longer circumcised, that's going to pave the way for Moshe Rabbeinu to be recognized by Basi Bas Paro, he's a Jewish child. So, so, so Paro is banishing the decree, but eventually that's going to help him. So then he says like this, okay, Vayomer al he says to his nation, the Jewish people are getting big. But let's do something lest, he, uh, lest they, uh, they start uh, increasing. There'll be a war, he'll join our enemies. They'll fight us, we'll be thrown out of the land. So what do they do? They make, how does he try, taskmasters, that's the word. Lemana noso bisi vlosam to to afflict them. Vayiven ori miskinos leparo is piso mizrans. They start building these cities piso min ramses. The kasher yano also kenir bevechenir fos. The more they tormented them, the more they increased. Vayakutsu bipnei bnei Israel. The Egyptians felt like the Jewish people were thorns in their eyes. Now some of the commentaries say the word vayakutsu means, you know, when you take thorns out of a field, if you want to ever plant a field, what do you do? You remove the thorns so you can plant the better crop. So the Yakutsumi Pnei Bnei Yisrael, the Chassam Sofer says, that means that they felt that they were the thorns. The Egyptian felt, hey, you know, we're thorns who are being displaced over here so that the high quality of your stuff could be brought in. Okay? Now, this is the main post I want to get to today. Vayavidu Mitzrayim etz Bnei Yisrael B'Farach. The, the uh, Egyptians put the Jewish people to work with Farach with crushing harshness. Okay? Farach is crushing harshness. Now, there are several meanings what this word avodas perach means. The most basic meaning is just, just harsh labor. Harsh labor, they're putting them to, they're the absolutely backbreaking harsh labor. That's, that's the first idea. Second idea here is a little deeper. What that means is that 
The word perach means to crumble. The word perach means to crumble. Crumbling labor. Okay, that's, that's the plain meaning of the word. What's the thing called in the shul? Page 294. What's the thing called in the shul that goes on to your own Kodesh? Parochas, the parochas. You had a parochas in the, uh, uh, in the base of Megdash. The parochas is what separates the curtain that separates the holy from the holy of holies. It's called the parochas. And the parochas that we put on the Aron Kodesh that separates the Aron Kodesh from the shul, that's called a parochas, pei reish chof So it's the word perach. It's the exact same, perach, not flower. Perach with a ches is flower. Parochas over here, beferach is with a chof over here. So that really comes, the root of the word is, the root of the word is, what do you call it, is, is a curtain, a separating curtain. So, what's the idea here of avodas perach? What do you think, especially put yourself in the place of the king who wants to create a new policy? Separating the Jews from the rest correct, of the world. Correct, correct. What's the best way to do that? What's the best way to do that? Create a ghetto. sub, what's that? A ghetto. A ghetto, mm-hmm. essentially. So for they were the ghetto. They were in the ghetto of Goshen already. Now you create and you uh, uh, um, publicize a policy that the Jews are secondary class. That's also always worked. That happened in the Muslim countries, Jews are secondary class. It happened in the Middle Ages. Jews had certain laws that they were had to abide by a second class. And Paro is the really the, he's he's really the, the 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 first one who administrates this sort of policy. Remember that famous picture? That there's a famous picture for the Holocaust where the Jews are on their knees scrubbing the streets of Vienna, Austria. And you got all these Austrians are standing around jeering at them, right? And they're all they're all watching while the Jews scrub the streets. That's a very good strategic policy. If you want to get popular yourself and get the people pumped up on your side, there's nothing like picking on the underdog, especially when it's the Jew. So Hitler creates a policy to, to subdue the Jews. You're a secondary class. That's exactly what Paro does. That's the parochas. The parochas is there's going to be a separation right now, and it's a separation. Everybody's happy to join on the band. We're not making the Jews a higher class. We're making the Jews a lower class. And all of a sudden, the Jews are on their knees scrubbing the streets of Egypt, that's part of the policy of Avodah Yeah, go ahead. Does this mean that the, the Jews were, were starting to move from Goshen into, into the cities? Batimolei ha'aretz osam, exactly. Instead of staying where you are, we do the same thing, by the way. We do the same thing. Do you know, you know that there are, there are, there are uh, 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 contemporary opinions, so many contemporaries, that what happens in the United States? We've like, Jews have never done well when non-Jews have too much time on their hand. Jews have never, never been, never, it's never been good for the Jews. And so you have a situation, for example, in the United States where 80 million beer-drinking non-Jews are involved in watching football on a Sunday afternoon. Now, what would they be doing if they weren't? I don't know. So what do the Jews do? Instead of being productive and taking advantage of the time by going to a base manager and learning and doing something good, the Jews go to the football games. Right? That's not what we're meant to do. That's not, we, we should be taking advantage. You know, there's a diversion over here. In Europe, there were no diversions. If the non-Jews got drunk, then they chased, the Polish Jews, the, the Polacks then chased the Jews through the streets. You know, they, they got drunk and then beat up Jews. That was always a popular sport. So instead of that, we go out to them. That's not what we're meant to be doing. If they're distracted with theaters and circuses and, 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 and events, we're meant to get, get our, take advantage of it. It doesn't work that way in history. The Jews are always picked on. So, so the land is filled with the Jews, and the Jews are more than happy to fill the land. Stay home. Go to the base medrash. What are you getting involved with them for? Idea number one. Idea number two is a very, very important psychological idea. This is very, very important because it will give you an insight into what's happening in your own life. Avodas Perach, the commentator of the Gemara, says two opinions. One opinion is they were building buildings these pyramids, perhaps, whatever it was, these cities, and they were building it on soft, marshy land that was slipping into, that was sinking into the earth. Keep doing, keep doing it over again. Like, they're very, they just, uh, they, they, you know, sinking into the earth. The second opinion is it was role reversal. Men had to do the women's job, women had to do the men's jobs. So there are two opinions, what a Vodas Perak was. They actually role reversal. Put the aprons on the men, put the women out in the field, let them go, let them go to work. That's a Vodas Perak. Okay, what does that mean? 
The truth of the matter is I don't think that there's any dispute. They're both descriptions of the exact same thing. When you are building and it's sinking into the ground, what do you care? If you, let's say you have a job, you're working on a construction crew. They build a wall, we're paying you 50, what do they get? Construction workers get paid well, right? You don't get satisfaction. You, you get 20 bucks a, very good. I'll pay you 20 bucks an hour. You spend all day cementing, putting up a brick wall, and at the end of the day, the foreman comes over, he smashes the wall down, says, okay, build it tomorrow. What do you care? You're getting 20 bucks an hour. What do you care? The answer is that it is a basic need in human nature to feel that you've accomplished something. And if it's futile, they, you, you'd go nuts after a while. You can't take it. I remember once watching two checkout people in a, in a department store working for minimum wage or whatever checkout people get. I remember them counting out and comparing who got more money. Neither of them gets the money. Neither of them gets the money. But you got to feel that you, 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 know, you, you did something, you contributed, you accomplished. Okay, it's a job. It's a job. It's like any other job. There are different customers. You're helping people. But at the end of the day, you want to feel you accomplished. There's a famous, uh, did you guys ever take any uh, psychology courses or philosophy? I don't know if it's psychology. It's a famous story about a guy. I forget where this comes from. Guy's in prison for 20 years. And they have him, they have him chained to a grindstone. And the stone's on the other side of the wall. And he's grinding every day for 20 years. He's grinding and grinding and grinding. After for 20 years, they release him from prison. And the first thing he does when he's released to prison is to run outside to the other side of the wall to see what he's been grinding for 20 years. And he finds out there was nothing there. So he dies. Job's dead. Eh, some some Narish guy, whatever it is. At the end of the day, it's not such a Narish guy. At the end of the day, that's a human nature. I, I need to know. I can't. I, I'm not futile. I, I got to know. A guy, a guy who works on a construction, I, I built that highway. I built that building. You have to feel you're doing something. So first thing is to break the morale of the people. Start building. And it's endless. It sinks into the earth. It, it, it goes, it sinks into the earth. That's, that's, that's the idea of building buildings. You see, role reversal is the exact same thing. Role reversal is the exact same thing. Because there are two things that feel endless. There are two things that feel endless. One is where you're not accomplishing anything. And the other is where you feel you're totally inadequate. I'm totally inadequate. Put a woman on a construction crew, a Beis Yaakov girl, sorry, Beis Yaakov girl on a construction crew, she will feel totally inadequate. I'm not talking about some lady from Kentucky. I'm talking about, you know, you know put a, you know, take a woman from, from, what do you call it, from, 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 uh, from Louisiana, it might be different. But if you take a, if you take a, a Beis Yaakov girl and put her on a construction crew, she's totally, it feels totally, when you're doing something, you feel totally inadequate. It feels forever. If I ever got to fix something at home, Certain things I'm good at fixing, races, you know, stuff like that. But if I got to fix a, I got to fix a piece of electronic equipment, and I'm not good at it. It's frustrating. It's endless, and I feel totally inadequate at it. Right? Number one, it, it it's as opposed to a healthy challenge, I feel totally inadequate at it. When it comes to a man doing a woman's role, it's very much the same thing. It has nothing to do with how much you love your children. I'm not in the home. I don't know where the towels go. Every adventure in changing a diaper, I remember when I used to change, you know, you first got to get the diaper, you got to get the diaper cream, you got to get the what do you call it, you got to know how to hold the baby, you got to you know, get the wipes, get the, and I don't even know where the stuff is. All of a sudden, your baby's sitting and now the baby's crying and you're running around and it takes you, it takes you 20 minutes just to set up the room to go change the diaper. To be there, the baby's screaming, the two-year-old's running around the house and you're ready to jump off a roof because you're totally inadequate. That's why men could go mad staying home. Men could absolutely go mad. There's a story, a guy comes over to his boss. He says, hey, boss, uh, you know, uh, um, um, we're moving next week, and my wife needs a lot of, lot of help around the house. Do you think I could get a couple of days off? He says, no, sorry, Rick. We need you down here. He says, thanks, boss. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, it has nothing to do with what do you got. It has nothing to do with love. Or not, because I, you're, you're totally inadequate, number one. Number two is a second thing here. You see, men are made differently than women. So we have time-bound mitzvahs. Why do we have time-bound mitzvahs? Because we work on a clock, or at least we should. I, by the way, I cannot understand anybody existing without a wristwatch, especially a Torah Jew who needs to know what time Kriya Shema is, what time Shema, what time's Minyan, what time's Mincha, what time Shema. We're always looking, you gotta be looking at a watch. I can't understand a living without a watch. But at the end of the day, a man needs to see some sort of accomplishment. Raising children is a very slow process. You don't see any, any concrete steps. You stay home, all men the same thing. Wife says, take care of the baby. First thing a man says is, does he need to go to sleep soon? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, always, always. Because yeah, what do you say with it? We can just sit there holding it, and, and I'm not seeing any results. It's not like the kid says, hey, that was great, Dad. Now I know all of me. It yeah, <laughs> doesn't work that way. You just kind of hold the kid, and the kid goes, <laughs> until the kid starts screaming. You know, it's a very slow process. And the women are nurturing, which is why they don't have a time. They, don't, they have more patience. For that sort of that sort of thing, that's what the Torah. That's what the Torah is saying. You know what they did to the Jewish people? They broke their spirits. How they break their spirits? Stay home with the kids for five minutes. Stay home. Stay home for ten minutes. Okay, right? I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I used to make my wife when she'd go out. I say, go out for as long. Do what you want. Have a good time. But let me know when you're coming home. I got to know what time. I don't care if you come home in an hour or in three weeks. But I got to know when this ends. Right? Because it's absolutely endless. You're just following the kid around the house. Sometimes the kid is just walking, and the two-year-old is happy, and you can't take your eye off him, and all you're doing is walking around the house following the kid around. Then you sit down for a second, and you read the newspaper, and next thing you know, oh, no, no. <laughs> and, you, and you go, don't touch that. You know, you're, and you're right, you can't relax for a second. You can't relax for a second. My brother said to me once when, when, when I had to stay over because early, early in the days, my brother said, my brother had more kids, he, and I, I had, I, you know, I stay home. I think my wife was in the, it was in the, in the, in the, in the wedding call. She went to the, to the recovery place after you give birth, and I had to take care of a bunch of kids in the house. My brother said to me, good luck trying to go to the bathroom. It's true. It's true. It'd be, you walk in, and then you go, ah! <laughs> smack. You know, you got to come run out and break a fight. And so you could, you could go batty from it. As a man, you could go batty. That's about a spirit. Okay. Um, so uh, then uh, uh, the, the king takes uh, more aggressive action. Take a look at page 290. Take a look at Pasuk Tesvav. Vayomer Melech Mitzrayim la Mialdos Ivrios. The king of Egypt says to the Jewish uh, birth, birth women, what are they called? Midwives. Asher Shema Achas Shifro, Shema Shenis Pua. One is called Shifro, one is called Pua. Now these are actually code names for who? Miriam is Shifra, is, is, sorry, sorry, Yocheved is Shifra, which is, uh, Yocheved is Moshe Rabbeinu's mother. And by the way, you'll notice the name Yocheved is a Yud Vav, which is part of Hashem's name. Chaf Beis Dalet is Kabed, honor. Yocheved is the honor, which eventually is going to be Moshe Rabbeinu who honors God. And Pua is Miriam. Now, the plain meaning here is that Shifra means She's mishaperes as of blood. When a baby comes out, a baby can come out sometimes all, all wrecked. And you need the midwife to try to straighten out the limbs. And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the babies uh, has to do with midwifing. How you take the baby out has to do with the shaping of the head and stuff like that. There's something called skill. There's a skill in being a midwife. So the, 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 the Yocheved is the physical midwife. She takes the baby out and she's got the skill of, you know, and there's a way to do it. Sometimes babies come out. It could be a breech birth and, and you got you to deal with it. Uh, and, and Miriam is pua. Pua means that she, she kind of coos the baby. She, she calms the babies down and she coos them. She, she's helping out in the, in the thing. So they are the two Jewish midwives. Now, uh, there's, uh, there are opinions that they were the heads of the organization because there are so many women. Obviously, they couldn't be doing the whole job themselves, especially when they're giving birth to six at a time. Right? So one is called Shifra, one is called Pua. So we'll see tomorrow why Shifra is called Shifra. We'll see another idea what the, what the idea is behind Shifra. We'll see another idea what the Anpua is, and we'll see what the, uh, what the decree is. All right. Yeah.